Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be here, and it's a very proud moment for me as a landscape architect. And this morning's panel was nothing short of inspiration. One phrase stuck with me uh, from the councilman this morning, um, that we're watching this city that is self-actualizing. And I thought that was such a beautiful, a beautiful phrase and beautiful way to um, talk about um, what we are all about today. I want to thank all of you who are here and who have given us such a warm welcome. My colleagues and I came in late January, had a wonderful two days here combing the park, and uh, it's wonderful to return after giving a tremendous amount of thought and reflection on all that we have learned. I have to qualify my presentation today in that I would not want to presume to know nearly as much about this park as all of you do. Uh, you are the experts, and um, we have learned a tremendous amount, and so we're going to put our own lens on this uh, today to set the stage. So much of what we've heard this morning, I think, emphasizes the next generation of San Antonians and um, what we leave behind as our collective legacy for improving the quality of city life for all. Today I want to touch on aspects of Brackenridge Park that make it special in the heritage of American parks and hint at its promise for the future. Parks give us so much, and we've heard a great deal about this today, uh, both in the past and as we see it for the future. Um, we like to say that they humanize and civilize our cities. They are part of the making of culture, and Brackenridge Park certainly does this for San Antonio. But parks also shape individual lives. We like to say that they have tremendous impact on our shaping of character. I have become more and more interested in the outdoor experiences that impact our childhood, especially as they return to us in the form of memories that ground us. Growing up in southwest Louisiana, my family would drive some 20 minutes north of town to Sam Houston State Park. Even though we lived in a house with a great yard, with a pastoral land surrounding the town, we would go there to experience the sheer elemental beauty of the Sam Houston River flowing through ancient cypress woods on its way to the Gulf. We went during flood stage when it was dangerous, and we went during droughts. Hot or cold temperatures didn't matter. Every time it was awesome. We organized the day around a meal. We played in the woods, and we swam and fished in the river. On some days, we were by ourselves. Other days, we could be with large groups of people. It was an underdeveloped tract, except for a few drives leading to spurs that took us to a number of spots of unparalleled wildness. I'm sure most of you have had similar experiences, and I know that they shaped me as a landscape architect. Well, historically, parks have emerged from four imperatives. These have been touched on today in various forms, um, but I wanted to address not only how parks have come about, but the recognition that they have required radical political strategies to affect change. They were conceived, on one hand, to improve degraded environmental conditions from overcrowding and overdevelopment that were impacting public health. Olmsted's Back Bay Fins, which you see here in Boston, reimagined the unsanitary Muddy River as an extensive expanse of the familiar coastal salt marsh meadows to clean up the unhealthy condition of the 1870s city. Much like we heard today about the Mission Reach, this also is a completely constructed landscape. The second imperative was to reform social and cultural conditions of the city. Nature provides a common platform for all walks of life. It nourishes the mind and soul, and we know that Frederick Law Olmsted was steeped in the 19th century belief that landscape worked its powerful and healing effects through our imaginations. At a level below consciousness, 
when we are unawares. Parks were an agent of this belief as an antidote to the frenetic city. The third imperative was to spark real estate investment in the growth and improvement of the city. We've heard much about this today here. I think here of Chicago's Columbus Park and other works of urban infrastructure that made way for the city to develop. The river here in San Antonio is an example of a linear park system that has catalyzed growth. And last, to conserve sites of extraordinary natural beauty and cultural value, our national parks. Through careful and minimal interventions, they connect us to the awesome power of nature. For these reasons, the American Park makes a distinctive contribution to our nation's democratic legacy and cultural heritage, as does Brackenridge to San Antonio. But as we reflect on the park within these traditions, it doesn't seem to fit neatly into any one of these categories. However, we might say that it resides in them all, in all of them, operating at all of these levels. And I want to return later to this idea of how to situate Brackenridge Park within the American park tradition. For sure, Brackenridge Park fulfills its democratic purpose, which is one reason we call it a people's park. It provides a cultural theater for everyday life. In early February, when my colleagues and I visited, it was a beautiful 80 degree winter day. Mothers were strolling with children. People were exercising, reading, sleeping, cooking. One guy parked under a tree was proudly polishing his beloved truck. There was a palpable appreciation of the place. And in these ways, Brackenridge serves as a classic urban park developed in a rapidly industrializing San Antonio as a much needed oasis where water and shade are everything. My taxi driver taking me to the hotel asked me what I was doing in San Antonio. I said that I was here to see Brackenridge Park as a landscape architect. He said that he and his family went to the park five or six times a year. And I asked him, well, what, why do you go there? What do you like about it? And he said, the trees. At our project in South Cove, Battery Park City, New York, along the Hudson River at the tip of Manhattan, we grounded the park design in the cultural legacy of the city's river edge with the goal of getting people in contact with the water by getting them close to its surface, able to cross over it, much as people enjoyed the river piers of the waterfront's industrial past. We also wanted the park to evoke the character of natural coves endemic to the Northeast Coast. Its pervasive and dense tree canopy offers shade and protection from the exposed conditions along the vast expanse of the Hudson River. Today, it is highly used and beloved as a distinct destination in the city. When the project was completed, the critic Tony Hiss described the park as, quote, replacing the city and, quote, returning New York as a river city. He invoked a passage from Melville's Moby Dick describing Manhattan in the 1850s, which foreshadowed the beginnings of the American Park Movement a decade later. Quote, but look, here come more crowds pacing straight for the water. Nothing will content them. They must get just as nigh the water as they possibly can without falling in. And there they stand, miles of them, leagues, inlanders all. They come from lanes and alleys, streets and avenues, north, east, south, and west. Yet here they all unite. Brackenridge holds the power, this power, to connect people to water. While the river provides the heart of the park, Brackenridge has developed essentially by accretion in an amenity-driven way and for much of its development without the guidance of a comprehensive vision. This is not unusual, but there can be liabilities to a view that Parkland is always open to adding amenities. This was a big subject, I think, for this morning's panel, and it's worth further uh, consideration. But as a country, we have a practice, particularly in southern towns and cities, 
of municipal parks that have been filled with active programs. In some cases, this is in the early to mid 20th century with the advent of the car, parks were conceived for driving around in the car. Some of the most beautiful park drives resulted with the intent to get people out into nature through leisure driving. On the other hand, we have to be vigilant about the temptation to grab parkland for everything from ball fields to libraries. We see this trend today, and Charles Birnbaum has written frequently about it. Too often we witness the destruction of the very attributes that inspired the selection of parkland in the first place. It is easy for us to forget what we have valued in the past and why. For sure, a park must provide these activities and amenities for social interaction. We all want to exercise, play, learn, dine and picnic, visit the museum and the zoo. And it must be a safe place for all of these activities and with healthy ecological systems. It must entice and reward. These things are true of Brackenridge. Today, however, I want to make the case that the promise of Brackenridge Park lies in revealing and interpreting the stories of its cultural heritage in ways that go beyond its activities and ecological health, even though these are undeniably important and essential to a successful future. Specifically, I ask all of you to think of the park as also eliciting the kind of connections that nourishes the mind and soul, much as Olmsted had planned in the 19th century through the experience of its cultural stories. The park possesses an allure emanating from its compelling past, a complexity that my colleagues and I found a bit overwhelming on our first walk around the park, and that has not diminished as we have dove into uh, trying to come and understand it. A little anecdote here that Charles told last night, um, but after our uh, experience of visiting Bracken Brackenridge Park and after having been excited to participate in this great moment, um, having seen this amazing place, I texted Charles from the park and said, you bastard. We knew a symposium on this park was not going to be easy. So why at Brackenridge do I advocate for us to look back in order to move forward? Simply answered, it is to better know the place, to understand where we come from, but most importantly, to not lose it as we change it, and because the stakes are high. For Brackenridge, decisions about change in the park can impact a community's heritage and identity. How do we make this whole story understandable as we make changes to meet vital needs of a growing community? I ascribe to the landscape historian J.B. Jackson's position, quote, I hold the peculiar belief that the value of history is what it teaches us about the future. To give you an example of what I mean, I mention our work at Bennington College in Vermont, where gaining an understanding of the place was essential to the success of future campus improvements, as well as in engaging all the constituents who love it. The 600-acre site evidences over 200 years of development, including the college's tenure, during which the campus has grown by accretion without the benefit of comprehensive planning, much as Brackenridge Park has evolved. At Bennington, we set out to determine how to value its variety of built and natural features, and there are many, and to find out what brought cohesion and coherence to this unusual campus. We began documenting different eras of growth and change. We wanted to know the provenance of what we were looking at. I want to go through these diagrams, which are rather abstract, but we're looking at an aerial photo of the 600-acre campus. And what we begin to document in doing the historic research were these different layers uh, that had contributed to what we saw today. This is the agrarian heritage of Bennington from the 19th century in its hedgerows, uh, its orchards, its groves of mature legacy trees, its barns, its farm ponds that are still evident on the site today. Then we add the estate era of the early 20th century, 
the beautiful sinuous drives, the hilltop location of the estate house, the terraces that were developed uh, for it. And then we move to the college's tenure with the Beaux-Arts period, where the beginnings of the college emerged with housing and classrooms, followed by uh, a period of modern development, buildings that were uh, designed to fit very carefully into the topographic form of the college. But here's what we end up with. We end up with a set of systems, landscape features, that derive from all parts of Bennington's past. And so the question became, where do we find cohesion today? This is what I want to talk about Brackenridge. Um, but in this case, the series of diagrams helped us to determine how these features brought identity to the college with the goal of helping to guide change as they set about to move into the future. This study captured the imagination of managers, students, alumni, trustees. It encapsulated the essential char character of their campus. The study elicited a clear response from the community. They valued the imprint from all eras of the landscape's evolution. Put all together, that story represented who they are. When we asked the question of what brought cohesion and coherence to this campus, we recognized that it was the topographic form of Bennington College, set high on the ridge, a plateau in the mountains that had incredible connection in all uh, 360 degrees of the Green Mountains. This helped us to determine siting of new buildings, of opening up the campus. And the most important thing, which is going to be a huge opportunity here at Brackenridge Park in vegetation management, here we realized that over many decades, Bennington had lost its connection to the mountains. And this was the thing that we thought could bring coherence. And so we set out on an editing excursion to reveal such things as uh, these photographs suggest. Here is how we have looked at and what we glean from Brackenridge Park. A good deal of what we see today has developed over the last hundred years as an urban park. In that time, it reflects the imprint of the wise benevolence of its founders and subsequent stewards, including all of you, before that of its industrial heritage and the imagination of the designer of Miraflores. There are distinctive physical features that lie within this veneer of time. I just want to comment on this beautiful image of Brackenridge to say that it suggests the health of the forest today is not what it was. There are distinctive physical features that exist, forests, groves, and grasslands, park drives and trails, distinctive buildings. Some, like its irregular landform, hearken much further back in geologic time, but all are organized around the beginnings of the San Antonio River. I want to explore this timeline for Brackenridge, which we find so compelling. We've heard a lot about this today, and so I want to try and graphically represent it. So we've done it in these two uh, bars of timeline, the lower one in green, talking about its initial beginnings some 12,000 years ago, even though we found in our research that, in fact, San Antonians are finding fossils and evidence of even a million years ago. But this is the green chart, which indicates at the far right the pink and purple areas, which represent the last 200 years. So we pull that up into the bar at the top, which is suggesting what has happened on this tract of land, say, from the early 1700s. The story of water is essential here. We've all acknowledged that its power is overwhelming. This is a representation of the San Antonio River as it makes its way from the headlands and the, the Edwards Aquifer through the city and the watershed along its way. We think of this as a very arid place, and it is. But then when we went to map all of the creeks that exist in this place, we're looking at 
this kind of network, so extensive and intricate, it was really surprising. And then you add the asaquias, which are threaded here, shown in red, and add to this layer of how water has been a part of this city from its beginnings. So I want to start here with the timeline. Here we're representing, and the park is outlined in uh, dashed lines, we're showing the floodplain in white with the uh, rise of topography, the landform that rises up to each side. Here is the park representing the Paleo-Indian settlements that archaeological digs have uncovered. These are all just very general, but we're talking about the evidence that has emanated over time from the river. Then the 17 to 1800 Spanish settlement in the mission building, where we're showing the asequia, the two that come on either side of the park, and indicating how this was a part of the feeding uh, you know, water to the fields and to settlements. 1800 to 1900, which is the industrial era, uh, where there is both extraction in the quarries as well as harnessing uh, of the water in the waterworks pump houses. And then the park establishment from 1900 to 1920, recreation and culture, where we're citing the beginnings of the zoological gardens, the golf course, uh, the Japanese tea gardens, and the green space that we know today. 1921 to 1930, where we're seeing Miraflores, um, the uh, witty museum formation, the polo field, commercial development along Broadway, and then 1931 to 2017, where this expansion of recreation and culture uh, came about with the ball fields and the music club, the driving range, further commercial development. And how each of these in this period, these institutions or uses have actually evolved to and with further elaboration. And so the composite of this today where we're showing here all these layers from 12,000 years ago to the present overlapping uh, onto this site. And much like Bennington College, you ask, or you acknowledge how fabulous this is, and then you say, well, what is it that brings cohesion here? Does it just represent more and more fragmentation? How do we reveal a continuum here? And so we set about to identify some opportunities. And I want to go through these four operations. These are not proposals, they're provocations. But we are aware that to answer this question of coherence and cohesion, that we could talk about reprogramming a large area of the park occupied by parking, ball field, and the golf range. We could address the edges issue, which has come out a great deal today, but here we're just identifying edges of the park where there are barriers or clear boundaries that could be obscured, that could be addressed. In the case of Long Broadway, we could open up the park to have an address on Broadway, but this is showing the in one hand, the opportunities that we have with edges. And what do you get? You get greater amount of contiguous open space. The next thing is revealing. How can we uncover and reveal and make visible this 12,000 year history? And here we're showing the ghosting in a way of the 12,000 year past and all of the other eras, industrial and otherwise, that have evidence on this site. And then, how do we connect it all up and make more connections to the river and across the river and unite this landscape? Then we have cohesion. Last, I want to leave you with this observation. Earlier, I talked about how Bracken Ridge doesn't fit neatly into any one traditional park model. I also told the story of my own childhood experience of the pristine nature of Louisiana's Sam Houston State Park. 
Slowly I've come to the realization, and I don't say it lightly, that Brackenridge may in fact be more like a national park. Not Yellowstone with 10,000 feet peaks. It's much more subtle and nuanced than that. But for us to think of Brackenridge in these terms allows us to see it in a new light, to value it differently. It begs the question, is the park being true to itself? And just as the park should be true to itself, so it allows us to be our authentic selves, something that is harder and harder in our often superficial digital world. The park helps us to be physically and emotionally well. It teaches us about the natural systems that we are inextricably a part of, but which we are becoming increasingly distant from. It connects us to our communities where we draw strength and support. However, I would advocate for something even richer than this. Brackenridge offers a place for us to understand this continuum of deep time, of culture. Here we can feel as though we belong to something bigger than ourselves, older than we are, or our parents, or our grandparents. It's a place where we can glean a sense of permanence. When we say we want Brackenridge to be sustainable into the future, it is more than ecological sustainability. As the philosopher Robert Harrison writes, quote, sustainability is linked to continuity and to the intensely human need to know that there will be fields and farms or wetlands and weather patterns or mountains and meadows long after our sojourn on earth has come to an end. Sustainability assures the natural unfolding of permanence. Connection. This word keeps coming up and for good reason. When we come to Brackenridge, we want to enjoy a connection to each other, to our communities, to our ancestors, to come to an understanding of why the city is here in the first place, to connect in meaningful ways to nature, and hopefully to cultivate in us a sense of what it takes to care for this land and for our planet. In the process, we will make new stories and new memories that shape the next generations that come here. The park's plan for the future will reflect what we value. For me, it must weave together all of the facets that will make it relevant to life today, a convergence of the cultural and the ecological, of the active and the evocative. There's an irreplaceable treasure here in Brackenridge Park, and this can be our gift to generations to come. Thank you.